Welcome to Black Man Lab. We are live Monday, January 11th. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. We are going to have a great lively discussion um, that's going to be about what got us here. And, and uh, when I'm talking about what got us here, it's going to hark back to last week, Wednesday, uh, where we saw uh, 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 insurgents. We saw um, just flat out foolishness overall. Um, but what, what got us to that point and, and uh, the depths of what got us to that point? But before we get into that conversation, a couple of things that we do here at Black Man Lab every week is um, do some housekeeping and making sure that we are of right mind and ready for a, a lively discussion like we are going to have tonight. Um, tonight I have uh, with me my brothers, uh, both Fred Parham as well as Jared Grant, who are, are board members with me of Black Man Lab, um, and they're going to help me to get this started off tonight. Uh, brother, brother Fred, if you could jump in real quick and say hello to the folks, and um, uh, also get people help us get a center uh, to get started. Yeah, absolutely, Marty. It's an honor to be here with these distinguished panelists, Dr. Carr and Dr. Jones. Uh, and I think it, as it as you alluded to earlier, Marley, Marty. <clears throat> The uh, insurrection and the tomfoolery that took place last Wednesday has a deep, deep beginning. Uh, and I can recall my ancestor's story in Haiti where they sought the wise counsel of their elders and they prayed to their gods. But before they, you know, took to the attack, uh, before they prepared to defend themselves, uh, they got their spiritual house in order. And so in the tradition of our ancestors before time was kept, uh, we must always keep our physical house in order. And how we do that in the mix of this chaos and turmoil, uh, we do it simply uh, by it taking a deep breath and centering ourselves and focusing our minds on the task at hand. And so in that spirit, uh, let us sit in a position and posture uh, that is comfortable and aligns our spine with uh, the perpendicular. And as you hear my voice, take a deep breath. One, two, three, exhale, three, two, one. The magic of that to all of the ears be beneath my voice is eternal. Taking a deep breath and centering oneself before action is always good advice. Back to you, Marty. And appreciate you, Fred. Thanks so much, man. Um, and you ain't never lied, brother. That, that is something that gets us squared away every time, man. Um, and also, the other piece that uh, helps us to get squared every week is um, uh, bringing our ancestors into this space, this space that we call a safe and sacred space. Uh, for us as a black man, but for also for us as a black community. Um, and with that, I want to bring my brother Jared Grant on uh, to help us to bring on the ancestors and, and, and do a libation for us. Brother Grant. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Brother Marty, and welcome to our guests. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, as any African um, get together, we always like to um, also. Um, honor our ancestors, you know. Each of us was created by 10,000 ancestors and all of that came together to, to, to make you. And so we want to honor all of the wisdom, the knowledge, the survival um, that it took in order to create us, in order to the, the, the shoulders in which we stand on. You know, we stand on the shoulders of ancient Kemet, you know, Ashe. We stand on the shoulders of, um, of places like um, 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 ancient Ghana, Ashe. Uh, we, we stand on the, the, the shoulders of our ancestors who, who lost their lives in the Middle Passage, Ashe. Ashe. Uh, we stand on those shoulders of those who survived the Middle Passage and, and, and were able to endure and survive the onslaught of European um, oppression, Ashe. Okay. Yeah. And we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors uh, who 
who, who lived through domestic terrorism through Jim Crow, Ashe. Ashe. And we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, our own ancestral line. Just think of your own ancestral line, the, that which created you. I want you to think about that for a couple seconds. And then everybody raise a fist and on three, say Ashe three times. One, two, three. Ashe. 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 All right. Thank you, Brother Grant. I appreciate that so much. Ashe. And then, Normally, we, we are meeting um, live at the Andrew Young and uh, Walter, Andrew and Walter Young YMCA here in Atlanta. Um, and, and in that room, we always offer up love for any brother that um, has had a, a rough day rough week, rough month, rough year, or dare I say a rough, rough life. We just, we don't ask any questions. We just say if there's any brother in here that could use some um, Black Man Lab love, we invite them to come up and we wrap their arms around, wrap our arms around them um, and let them know that he's supporting. I'm doing that right now for all those that are listening. I want you to know that we as a community are here for you and we are wrapping our, our arms around you giving you that love, even though we're virtual right now. Know that that love is out there for you. Um, one, before we get kicked off completely here, I see my brother, the one of the co-founders of Black Man Lab is, is here, and I want him to jump in and say a quick word. Uh, today is his beautiful wife, my sister Jana's birthday, so he is preoccupied with that, but I definitely want him to say a word if he can. Miley, you there? I'm yeah. here. What's up, fam? I got the birthday. Hey, the birthday, birthday girl. Birthday girl here. She just uh, turned uh, 51. She's been looking at me because I'm looking at 52. <laughs> she, she robbed the cradle. She robbed the cradle. Y'all did. Um, brothers, um, this is a great honor, man. I've been knowing uh, Brother Kamathi Carr for um, literally, it goes back to 1995. Uh, uh, that's when I got the film, 95, 96. So we we talking about running up on 30 on 30 years, and then uh, Ricky Jones, we got in trouble uh, beginning in uh, 1987. So um, both of these brothers uh, have kept me on my toes um, in terms of just their, their intellectual prowess, always uh, fighting for our people, man. So it's an honor. I can't wait to watch this because I know y'all get ready to go in. I see all of our board, Brother Miguel, Brother Fred, Jared, Marty. Uh, this is going to be awesome. So I just wanted us to remember the sacredness of our space because we created it for our sons. We created it because we knew that we have to collectively educate them so that they can be the men that we need them to be in this moment. And it doesn't happen by accident. And all of our ancient teachings teach us that. That this is, has to be an intentional process. And that's what Black Men Lab is. So... Uh, appreciate you, brothers. Peace and blessings, hotel. And I love both of the speakers. <laughs> Just love you. Know, there you go. We love you too. Sis. Love Happy you birthday! Back, <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday, <laughs> Jay! Thank you. I don't even right, like man. you, Jana. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have fun. Love you. Love you too. All right. So uh, anyway, glad that uh, we got all of that out the way, man. We have a great discussion. I see my brother. Miguel Dominguez is on. Miguel, say a quick hi for us. Good evening, brothers. How's everybody doing? Doing well, well, brother. What up, Miguel? What's going on? So happy to have everybody on, man. Happy to be here. So grateful. Thank you for making time for Black Man Live, for sure. Absolutely. Thanks, man. We don't, we don't get to have brother Miguel is usually you know, extremely busy. So having them here means that y'all must be fairly special. So uh, with that, I want you to give a quick introduction of yourselves, and then we're going to dive into this conversation, man, because I know I know you two brothers, and I know that you can you can pontificate with the best of them, especially on a subject like what we're talking about today. So Brother Ricky Jones. Yeah, uh, Ricky Jones. I'm the chair of the Pan-African Studies Department at the University of Louisville attended the U.S. Naval Academy, but a graduate of Mighty Morehouse College right there in Atlanta, Georgia. That's my man, you know, Rick. Um, been out here going hard, 
for, for quite some time. Um, happy to be here tonight, especially getting to join a Titan like Brother Greg Carr, who's been holding it down in DC for the longest, but it's the first time that we get to speak together. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. And uh, let's get it. Man, man, you, you said a lot right there, Rick. Back in the Naval Academy days, I went to Howard. So Rick was you come down to Howard with Molly all the time and vice versa. I get up to the Naval Academy. And like you said, get in trouble. That's what used to happen. Good trouble though, right? Rick? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was I was at Howard, I was at Howard so much, Marty, that some people thought I actually went to Howard. Right. So right. Both, that's both why I graduated from Morehouse. <laughs> right. Both you and Molly. I had Molly was up at home coming with me one time and somebody came up to me and said, well, when did Molly graduate from Howard? I was like, he never went. <laughs> like never. <laughs> never. Oh, um, anyway, brother Carr. Oh man. Thank thank hey, amen. Thank you, brother Marty. Look, Howard is like Atlanta. Everybody knows somebody there. Right. So, I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm uh I didn't go to Howard. They let me work here, which is amazing. <laughs> but uh <laughs> Maybe they're working on that. But at any rate, <laughs> for the last, uh, I've been there now 21 years. This is my 21st year at Howard. But um, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, Tennessee State University. That's that's the place that that made me in terms of being an academic and uh, been in the Department of African-American Studies. And as Brother Ricky said, I mean, coming through the elders that we have tried to hold up the bloodstain banner. In, in these various places we call universities, which ain't never going back to the way they were before this plague. I, I, I think we all probably know that what we're doing right now is 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 the future. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get rid of that brick and mortar. Plus, these young people are not gonna really uh, put up with paying that kind of tuition <laughs> anymore. I think once this thing is over, so maybe that's a good thing. But yeah, I'm just glad to be here. I'm glad to be in this conversation, as Brother Molly said, man. I don't know what I don't know how y'all made it through the Naval Academy uh, through Annapolis like this, man. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the Philly streets, man. I mean, I'm like, yo, you rolling with the serious cats up here, man. So it's just it really is an honor. And and and, and the Black Man Lab, I, I just want to say this right quick is this is a space that not only shows the way to what we need to be doing for our young brothers, but it also shows how. That's not a competition with the sisters or any other uh, creation and combination of gender, but rather this is this is black men in service of black community. And we're for everybody who is in harm's way. So I think this is an extremely important space. So I'm just I'm glad to be in the space tonight, Brother Martin. Man, thank you so much. And and you know, both of you all have been uh, on as guests before and and you know this 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 topic that we have right now. Um, in front of us, we couldn't think of two better folks to have on um, to, to, to discuss this. And uh, also to your point, Dr. Carr, um, you know, the, one of the pluses of this virtual world is, is that, you know, normally it is just men in the room. Um, but here we're able to, to actually have these conversations with both men and women, of course, all ages um, in, in between. So, um, thank you all for being here. And with that, let's get started, man. Let's let's delve into this conversation. And, and the, you know, the topic tonight is what got us here. And, and when we talk about what got us here, everything that kind of culminated into what we saw last week. Because I, I felt like last week, and this is me personally, I felt like last week was a was a paper being popped. You know, you, you know, it was growing for a long time. Um, but finally, something happened where it popped. Um, tell me what your thoughts are, what you saw last week in the build up to it. Um, and I'll start with, with you, um, Brother Rick. Well, I don't think anybody who's really paid attention to the things that have been going on in this country was surprised by what happened last week. I mean, we've been seeing little conflagrations all over the country again, if you pay attention. And, you know, and I, I tell people continuously and folks say, well, you know, this has been building up for four years. And I'm like, nah, it's been building up for 400 years. Yes, sir. So, you know, if you haven't been paying attention to that, then, then you're missing something. But two very important points that I want to make. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who are making the argument that this is about Donald Trump. This is not about Donald Trump, and it's never been about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is just a manifestation. He is the logical end 
to what's been going on in this country really since its inception. And it's picked up speed lately because you're seeing the demography of the country change. You're seeing more black and brown babies dying. You're seeing being born, I'm sorry, they're dying too, but being born right now. You're seeing more black and brown people demanding their humanity in this country. And you're seeing the numbers starting to shift slowly but surely. And that goes to the second point. What this is really about is white supremacy. If you do not understand that this country was rooted, its foundation is built upon white supremacy. And white supremacy is not this cartoonish, you know, representation of white dominance that a lot of people want to reduce it to. Like it's just the Proud Boys or the Ku Klux Klan running through the streets with their robes and hoods on. White supremacy is an ideology that one group of people got the right to think, to know, and decide everything that goes on in the country. It is manifestly about power. It is about hegemony. It's about dominance based on race, right? This idea that the lowest white man is better than the highest black man. That's what white supremacy is really about. And so what we're seeing is white supremacy in the minds of many of these people in this country being threatened. And just like the demon in the Bible who, you know, possessed this child that my colleague Brandon McCormick talks about, you know, when that demon is being expelled, he goes hard in the end. So what you're seeing right now is a, a good percentage of white people thrashing. And I want to be really clear because I don't want anybody to say, oh, could I get called a racist? I'm called the biggest racist in Kentucky every week by white folks here, right? Even though I'm from Atlanta. If you speak... <laughs> openly, you know, and plainly and powerfully about race, then of course, the strategy is to say that you yourself are a racist. So I ain't saying that it's all white people, but white people who are sitting by silently while it's going on, you're guilty. The ones who participated in it actively, you're guilty. The ones who refuse to study, you're guilty. The ones who refuse to listen, you're guilty. And I say to our own people, you know, Brother Carr and I both are in black studies what Malefia Santi calls the most radical insurgency in the American Academy. And it is the most radical insurgency in the American Academy. But the one thing that Black Studies prompts us to do is one, not remake history, right, to fabricate history, but to engage a very real history about this country and center Black people in their proper place in this country. And I always say to Black people, then and now, we the conscience of this country. I shudder to think what America would be like if Black people hadn't been here to try to pre provide some type of humanity, some decency, some idea about freedom, justice, and democracy. We have tried to, in effect, live what these folk say they aspire to, but they really don't. So I tell our people, man, you, 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 you got to be upright and on the square, as it were, right? You got to be game tight. You got to read. You got to study. You got to stop worrying more about, you know, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian than you do about the real world and what's happening with your people. You know, and so that, that's, that's where we are right now. So foundationally, Mark, this is really about white supremacy. And it's about white supremacy in every area that we look at. With that, I don't want to ramble on too long and step aside for Brother no, Carr. No, 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 say no, 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 Not at all. Not at all. I think that's the, man, you opened the way. I'm sorry, yeah. Marty. Go ahead, bro. No, no, no. I was gonna say you take take it from there. No, I think um, I don't know. I watched with a with a very deep enthusiasm the events that unfolded last week, beginning with the end game of the last month or so that the non-white folk in Georgia. And a cluster of white folk came together in coalition to send Mitch McConnell to the minority leader, since Kentucky wouldn't do it, and to send <laughs> Lindsey Graham to scuff scurrying for his life through the airports, since South Carolina wouldn't do it, and to make Susan Collins irrelevant, since Maine wouldn't do it. In other words, to do what white people wouldn't do. So I agree with you, Ricky. Um, you know, we saved America. Now, that is a... Uh, it's not our objective. <laughs> so all these people who are, you know, trying to secure their coin in white facing mass commercial news entertainment media by telling America that we're committed to saving America, please understand that the American Negro is voting in self-defense. <laughs> I don't give a damn about that American flag. In fact, when people were so shocked 
to see the stars and bars, the Confederate battle flag in the Capitol Wednesday. Uh, clearly, they haven't studied enough history to understand that the only reason the Confederates switched to that battle flag, which they did very late, by the way, in the war, was that when they first set out to fight the Union Army, the flags, the original stars and bars, were so much alike, the soldiers couldn't tell the difference between the two. <laughs> so therefore, they had to switch to a blood red field. And so that's where you get that. So that Confederate flag belongs under that Capitol Dome as much as the American flag, since at the time that dome was built with the help of enslaved Africans and the African who cast the actual Statue of Freedom that's on top of that dome, the battle flag was flying very briskly throughout the country. And since at the time, uh, a dude named Blair, uh, it's Francis P Frank Blair, Francis uh, Blair, who lived across from the White House in a series of row houses, they still now, now they call them Blair House. That's where Joe Biden is going to spend the night before he come over and get sworn in on the 20th. Blair wrote a, a little message to a guy in Missouri who was in the state Senate and said, look, we got to stop these radical Republicans because they're going to mess around and get a Negro suffrage. <laughs> they're going to do all of this. So I think, I think the Confederate battle flag is at home under that dome. I think the Blue Lives Matter flag, which was brilliant, beautifully uh, exposed. I mean, Blue Lives Matter as long as they're protecting white lives. So mm -hmm. that was exposed. Um, but anyway, I, I don't want to belabor the point that I think I think the way and Greg, please, and you brothers, man, you know them, them licenses is like driver's licenses. They don't mean nothing until you unless you get stopped by the authority. So they just drop all the doctors and stuff tonight. But um, one of the reasons I was looking forward to this conversation and, and looking forward to our conversation tonight is <clears throat> it affords us an opportunity to be more sophisticated and to display that our commitments are to each other, to our community. They are not to um, a geographical designation called the United States of America, which is not a nation. It's a white settler state that dispossess human beings of their land, of land they were occupying. And it is a land in which all of these various nations have had to contest to avoid being subjugated to the very nature of the question of white supremacy that Ricky has brought up. As Neely Fuller said, if you understand white supremacy, how it works, you know, you, everything else you think you understand will only confuse you. Roy Brooks calls it racial inferiority because white is not supreme. White, in fact, is artificial. But the embrace of whiteness is what allows the people who have been marked as white to create and, and, and sustain a hierarchy. Many of them didn't help create it, but they double down and triple down on it because particularly for those who don't have material resources, it is the most valuable thing in their lives. And that's what we saw on display un, under that Capitol Dome. There were rich white folk, children of legislators, legislators themselves, like the cap came from West Virginia. Uh, by the way, we'll talk about Joe Manchin later on, but they were also there with those who you know, didn't have much money. But the thing that bound them together is they feel it all slipping away. And guess what, baby? It's slipping away. Yeah. It ain't never coming back. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Greg, that's, that's exactly my thoughts when I watched that. I was like, they see their white supremacy slipping away. And, 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 it, and it enrages and makes them just crazy, you know, because that, all the actions were crazy, right? They're, they were barbaric. They talked about, you know, first of all, busting windows, going through the Capitol, putting feces on the floor, urinating in the, in the place. Who does that anyway? You know what I mean? Like, who does that in any right? That just doesn't happen, right? So that's, that's kind of barbaric mentality, um, which, which, again, I'm sure we can go even deeper into the, the DNA of white supremacy and have that, that conversation. Um, but, I'll, but, but Marty, that, but that, Marty. that kind of makes sense too, though. And I, but, I think I think that you 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 hit it on the head when you said there's a certain craziness. You know, I've never watched the television show Fargo, right? But I listened to an interview with the showrunner, Noah Hawley, and he said, uh, he said he, he was talking about a character who is a nurse, but she's killing people, right? She's a murderer, but she's a nurse. Mm -hmm. and, and talked about her insanity. 
And he said, he said, you know, she's really representative of the country because there is a certain madness that is inevitable if you are a thing, but you deny being that thing to your last breath. Mm. And that's America, right? America yeah. is full of mendacity, that is lies, full of inhumanity, right? But talking about, you know, freedom and decency and, and, and all of these things, it's, it, the country is not just a contradiction, it is a lie in and of itself. And so it, these people have to be driven to madness eventually. You know, so what we're trying to do, as, as brother, brother Greg said, with our own people, is try to keep as many of us sane as possible because God knows there are a lot of black people who have lost their damn minds. Look, man, I'm from Atlanta, but I live here in Kentucky right now. And I think the greatest representation of that insanity that we see because of racial disconnection and being submerged into this world of white supremacy and lies and self-hatred is Daniel Cameron. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he's representative of it. And I love him. Make no mistake about it, all right? He's one of my old students. You know, and y'all messing with me before the show started. <laughs> Who's that? I, 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 he's my fault, right? I mean, you can't save everybody, man. To you, bro. <laughs> but, but I try. But he's a representation of the madness that can happen mm. when you lose sight of yourself, right? On both sides. When Du Bois talked about the veil that separates these worlds, some things that you reach beyond that veil as a black person to try to retrieve from that white side ain't so good for you. Mm. So there's a madness there. You know, and the last thing, Brother Greg is right too, you talk about voting. Look, this older brother told me once, he said, black people have always been smart about voting. We vote for survival. Because the Democrats will kill us. No question. All right? But they'll wait till next week. The Republicans will do it tonight. So what we're voting for every time we vote for a Democrat, we vote for seven more days to plot. That, that's, that's all black people who understand what they're doing is doing. Anybody who is, is super excited about Joe Biden, come on, man. You don't understand what's going on around you. Anybody that's super excited about his vice president, and I ain't going to say nothing back because I don't want the AKs to come for me, but you don't really understand what's going on and how sister got to where she is and what her ideology is. I'll leave that at that. Yeah, I, I, and I think, I think that at, at some point we have to be comfortable separating the two out, right? You talk about society and you talk about politics. Like society issues of white supremacy is where it is in the Politics is something separate in that politics, it can have white supremacy all the way through, whether you're independent, Republican, or, or Democrat, right? We can see it within, you know, the, the Democratic Party is supposed to be the liberal party, but we see plenty of, those of us that have, have our eyes open, can see plenty of white supremacy, white supremacy through that. And um, we get, I think, as a people flossed over a lot of times or glossed over, I should say, um, that we think, okay, the Democratic Party is is in power, so good for us. All we gotta do is look at history. Yeah. It hasn't changed the whole lot. Look at where we are today, right? You had we've had a black president, we've had a, a president that they said was black, but it wasn't Clinton, um, and and plenty before that, right? So here we are still seeing our, our, our nation's capital um, being taken over or trying to be taken over, um, really based off of race, right? Um, Jared, you want to jump in? Yeah, you know, the idea, um, I wanted to throw a question out there too, and, and, and just to preface it, um, you know, the concept of globalization itself or the actual implementation of globalization uh, was started through white supremacy with the onslaught of the slave trade. You know, that was a, um, um, that was globalization uh, run amok um, as it, it created this system of hierarchy as you spoke to a little bit earlier. But white supremacy invested in black inferiority, the flip coin 
The flip side of the coin is black inferiority. It invests heavily in ensuring that the idea that um, blacks may not gain, there is a zero sum total. Anytime we gain anything, you know, there is a white investment to ensure that um, there's a, a there's a white backlash, if you will, and that backlash we have seen when blacks um, became um, senators, legislators, mayors. Uh, you would see uh, white backlash destroy black towns, destroy black government. Um, and, uh, throughout the United States historically. So I just want to, I'm just going to ask you to speak to um, the flip side of white supremacy, that it invests wholly into black inferiority, meaning the oppression, meaning the killing and death, uh, state-sanctioned death, as we see with our police. I love what you said, um, um, Brother Ricky, when you talked about um, you know, the reaction that white supremacy has um, towards Blacks. So I, I just want to see if you all can speak a little bit to the flip side. What's the flip side of um, uh, white supremacy as it invests in Black inferiority? I think you muted, uh, Brother Carr. Am I muted? Oh, you're good. No, you're good now. Okay, cool. Oh, you're good now. Okay, thank you. One of the um, one of the things, brother Rick, you kind of is one is one of the themes that you bring up in that book you put together. Uh, uh, what's wrong with Obama mania? Is this is this sickness? Is this madness of of race and how it operates? And as you say, Jared, whiteness as a field of perpetual violence. That that's that's really informed by this insanity that will drive people insane. Thinking about it in the context of human difference, how have we managed difference as a species? You know, and, and, and thinking about world history, I mean, we are, we're all going back to school, you know, Ricky and I got to go meet the mule, soon semesters open up. And increasingly, I mean, we live in a society with amnesia, as Gil Scott Heron said, they don't want to go back next week, much less so to get young people in particular to think about how human beings have created social formations and the role of difference in those various formations, to have them understand that we've always recognized difference as species, but, but how we've done it has been very specific to time and place, to culture. Right. You know, the Egyptians and the Nubians, for example, saw each other as related but distinct from each other. So you fast forward to now, and the Egyptologist will, will translate a word, Nahisi, as Negro or Black. And then there's another term in, in comedic language, and our brother Mario Beatty, who's here at Howard with us, I mean, the finest student of Egyptian language there is. Mm. He's written about this. He says, you know, the white Egyptologists assume that because the Egyptians called the Nubians wretched, that they were enemies. But after he goes back, having been trained by Theophilo Benga, who was protege of Sheikh Ante Jop, and then Jacob Carruthers. And he says, I'm translating this through a cultural lens to show, and he went to, actually went to this, the Association of Egyptologists in Rhodes, Greece, and blew up the whole meeting, because all these white Egyptologists are there, and he's there like Neo by himself, <laughs> and destroys the whole field by saying, these are black people who saw each other as distinct, but they're using wretched the same way. In some ways, we use the word trifling sometimes to members in our family. <laughs> you say you trifling. You know, there's a, there's a, and no one had any response because the assumption is that the world treats difference the way whiteness was generated to treat it by rank ordering those who are different from you, beginning with those who are most unlike you, and then coming to the ones who are closest to you, but all of them are less than you, this racial subordination. So when we look at world history, we, all over the globe, we see people recognizing difference, but we don't see anything, at least anything I'm aware of, in the world experience recorded hum, human memory of, of the hu, species human beings, where difference has been created in a way to harden into a hierarchy that is displaceable. So whiteness, people, as James Baldwin, white people trapped by whiteness, 
You, because the minute you try to come out of whiteness, those who choose to remain will attack you. See how them white people in Oregon, they were white in Portland and they got attacked. Why? Because the, uh, the white people who have to hold on to whiteness understand that they must defend it at all costs, even against other white people. So I'm saying I have to say that in, in this context, Jared, is, you know, think about the, the price that we've paid. Without historical memory, we are in perpetual danger of attributing our ability to survive, to negotiate, to thrive even in these, particularly in these black spaces, to racial solidarity rather than extensions of Africana cultural meaning making. And so whether it be Tulsa, so-called Black Wall Street, whether it be the black districts of where we're all different, all places we're from, we hold those up as evidence of progress when in fact they're really, it's really much more of a mixed bag. And the reason that they were able to flourish when they did was because of that combination of us embracing humanity in a way that allows people who recognize our common humanity to thrive and the hard wall of segregation that would create in Louisville a, 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 an inward hill, for example, where Houston Baker came out of in Louisville, these places like that. But once you take away the hedge of segregation, what becomes diminished is our capacity to pass on the knowledge of our cultural DNA to our children. And now we start drifting away like the Daniel Cameron's and them. And now once that has happened, because whiteness has never been displaced as a cultural logic, it will continue to attack us without our capacity to generate institutional self-defense to protect ourselves against it. So, and, and then there, that, that becomes the difficult, the, the difficult, how can I put it? The difficult alchemy of how we can survive now, because now you got black folk who think that a vote for the Democrats is a vote for white supremacy. Because we have lost part of the ability to inst pass on the institutional playbook on how you build political power in part by negotiating in the field of violence you find yourself in. And that doesn't mean you identify with these people and those who do, you keep them on the periphery. I hope I, I haven't been too abstract and vague about that, but I think it, 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 it cause whiteness is perpetually, this is the last thing I'll say, whiteness is perpetually reinventing itself to maintain its dominance. That's what all this, uh, this is what all this throw Trump out piece is. He's used up, so now they're all going to turn on him so they can reinvent whiteness, what uh, the field systems them call race craft. They're going to reinvent it so they can preserve it. And, but, you know, we ain't going to go for that. We see what that is. You're on mute, Rick. Yeah. You're, you're totally right, Brother brother Greg, about, about whiteness. And to your, your question, uh, Brother Jared, here's what's so insidious about whiteness is that it's omnipresent, but it's invisible, right? Once whiteness is calcified in a society, it's considered, it's considered the norm, right? Everything is measured against it. So when you say black inferiority is the flip side of whiteness, everything is in effect the flip side of whiteness. There's one side of the coin here, but then there are myriad sides on the flip, mm -hmm. right? So the closer you are to whiteness, the closer you are to that privilege, to that, you know, parad paradigmatic paradise. And the farther away you are from it, you know, the more hellish your existence. So that's why blackness is always challenged. So that, that's huge. Like, think about the academy, right? Think about higher education. Brother Greg has heard this. I've heard this. Anybody that deals in black studies or, or is affiliated with black studies in any way has heard this, for instance. People have the, the gall to say, well, black studies, Africana studies, African-American studies, Pan-African studies, that's racist because it's called black studies. It's, it's racist, you know, inherently by its, its very labeling, right? This, this is an attack on black studies. The proper retort to that is not just, no, it, it's not racist. The proper retort to it is now nah, we're really a very small, mighty, but, but, but very small attempt at a corrective. Because you go over to the sociology department of any school, many of the HBCUs too, because that's, there's some HBCUs who try to out European the, the Europeans. <laughs> but especially the PWIs, you go over to the sociology department, 
they don't have to say it's white sociology. That's understood. You go over to the history department, they don't have to say it's white history. It's understood, right? Philosophy, it's white philosophy. It's understood. So the whiteness is always there, but it's so insidious because it doesn't have to be stated. Now, what Brother Greg was talking about on this institutional level, and we've seen this travel throughout the history of this country and globally, you're right, because white supremacy is, again, omnipresent. But to your original point, Marty, when you talked about, you know, separating politics from, from other things, from, from, from social structures, you can when you talk about um, um, white supremacy. I'm an old political scientist. Now, I, put, I committed discipline suicide a long time ago and became a black studies scholar. But a great political scientist wants to find politics like this. People think it's just going out to vote. No, it ain't. Politics, Harold Laswell said, is the process that decides who gets what, when, where, and how. The process that decides who gets what, when, where, and how. So politics, by its very nature, is all about power. Black people understand that, right? Because you have a brother in the hood, you can have a brother in the Carver Homes housing projects where I grew up down in Atlanta, who won't get a job at a company where he is, won't get a promotion, and he'll say, yeah, man, you know, that was political, bro. It was political, right? So he's calling politics out for what it is and how it bleeds outside of these traditional superstructures, right? Institutional superstructures into the everyday individual lives of us all. And whiteness is always present there. That's what makes white supremacy so incredibly hard to combat because you can't get away with it. And Brother Greg, Brother Greg was right on when he talks about how it constantly remakes itself. It is fluid, man. It's fluid. And there is no safe retreat. Even in Atlanta, which is the current black Mecca, there is no safe retreat, right? So. That's that's my thought on that. And, and and we see that that reoccurring piece today more than ever because that's exactly what's happened with with Donald Trump. Would you all agree that, you know, although we know that this is over four hundred years um in the making, um what we saw with Donald Trump was a stamp of approval basically from white supremi supremia in terms of them saying, okay, we got our guy. And now we can just let it out the box. Um because we haven't seen we haven't seen that, right? We haven't seen in in recent years, we haven't seen where um the you know racist banner was just held so high. You know, it's always been there. We know that more than anybody. We know that. But now it's like you pick your side, right? And would would you agree with that? That that's been what we've seen here since he's been in office. Of course, and I'll be quick about this because I want to pass it back over to Brother Greg. Look, here's the sleight of hand, right? I've always said that the dyed in the wool, the more sophisticated white supremacists, right? The Mitch McConnells of the world, who make no mistake, is a white supremacist. The Lindsey Graham's of the world, white supremacist, white supremacist <laughs> politicians, right? The sleight of hand is this. Donald Trump was too much of a blunt instrument for them. He was just straight up telling people what was up. You know, he was like a, a, <laughs> a, 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 a coming to the line, telling the defense, yo, we about to run this, this, this mofo right over <laughs> the right tackle. Right, he, right. He was telegraphing everything. He was giving tools, right? where the more sophisticated people who are committed to white domination, they ain't going to say that to you. They're going to be like, no, we believe in multiculturalism. No, we believe in diversity and equal and, and, you know, and inclusion. You know, we, we believe in now anti-racism. These are things that we believe. Look, you know, we have a black attorney general that shows that the Republican party is committed to diversity in Kentucky, you know, Remember, we're the party that freed the slaves. And if mm -hmm. you're a historical sucker, you won't understand that that is actually true. The Republicans and Democrats simply flipped sides over the last 150 years. And if you understand that they flipped sides over the last 150 years, that shows you that they can flip sides again. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they're really all invested in the maintenance of the same system, but using different tactics. 
So the sleight of hand now is, yeah, Trump, we got to get rid of this fool. Mitch McConnell even said, oh, well, this is a threat to our democracy. All of these people, I'm shocked. I'm amazed. You know, we got to get this man out of office. Now, he's gone in 10 days anyway. But once he's gone, these people who are pushing that ideology but doing it in a much more insidious and, I might add, effective way because they so cool with it, as we used to say back in, in, in Atlanta, they not gorilla pimps, man. They smooth. <laughs> And then you get lost. You get lost in the weeds. And so that's mm -hmm. why I tell people, man, you better study politics more than you party. You better pay more attention to your brain than you do your body. All these people who working out and posting their damn workout pictures on Facebook every day, all day long. You know, what, <laughs> what are you reading? Right? What are you reading? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, bro, Greg. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, oh, well, no, no, actually, that's actually, you know, Ricky, you, uh, Brother, you put it, I think, exactly, you dovetailed it exactly into one of the things that we must focus on in terms of the political impact. And that, of course, is social media. It's not 20 years old. The cats who are writing the algorithms for what we're using now in terms of Twitter and all these other platforms, the gram, all that stuff is, what, 15 years old, maybe? YouTube, not much older than that, 20 years. There's always been political propaganda. I mean, James Callender, one who really ran that Sally Hemmings propaganda against Thomas Jefferson, but they were broadsheets. Oh, he only circulated through, you know, by the time you get to the 1930s and Hoover and the Lily White movement and the Republican Party and all that stuff, you know, by then you have what emerges in terms of the white nationalist movement in this country, Charles Lindbergh, um, what's the, uh, the Catholic minister who had the uh not billy sunday but uh yeah maybe who had the uh the, the 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 radio show they are some of them indistinguishable from the nazi party which we remember was an elected party in germany at the time you know this is telling the united states don't get in the war so there's always been propaganda and there's always been this propping this up however the impact of that same Facebook, as you say, that folks are watching now on or YouTube, the folks are streaming on now, where people, like you say, are, are, are uh, that has debased a form of slow literacy that allows us to be con contemplative. I mean, this is a conversation we normally be having in a barbershop or on a corner somewhere, and it might just be the 9, 10, 11 of us. But now the enhanced capacity to communicate also comes with the the effect of drinking from a fire hose it's it's coming from everywhere but it also unearths the things that were always there right so donald trump is absolutely a symptom of structural white supremacist cultural logic he's also an invention and a creation and some well not an invention a creation of a very deep enabling media structure which was all fun and games as long as he was the butt of a joke or swinging around in a, in a, in a home alone movie, or, you know, after all his money didn't run out, switching over and becoming a celebrity on the apprentice, but then social media weaponizes him, uh, mass commercial entertainment news media, CBS, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, forget the alleged ideological differences, see this as entertainment eyeballs, which means ad revenue. And who was trying to stop him? The very white nationalists you're talking about, Ricky, when we look at the primaries, the cruises and the grams and the, and the, they all, oh, this guy's a clown. Right. right. But by then, <laughs> social media had bypassed. And remember this social media, and we know this, you know this, Ricky, because you've written about this in part, the rise of Obama, who is also a media creation. This is yeah. where, this is where, you see, Bill Clinton spoke. Hey, be careful, Trump. man. Black, black people don't want to hear you say nothing oh, about I, Obama. You know, at 55, look, I'm, a, I'm, like our, I'm like our old uh, elder, our brother, and a man I was very close to, John Henry Clark. You know, at 55 now, I'm close enough to the grave to not give a damn. So in any way, <laughs> maybe, maybe in a hundred years, we'll be able to have a mature conversation about Barack Obama, if there's an earth, because we, we all doing this while global warming could burn us off the ball and reset. There'll be an earth. They may not be human beings. But I ain't going to take the chance, and I'm going to be here long enough for people to have a mature conversation. I'm going to say it now. Barack Obama, this is what got Bill Clinton in trouble. Remember during the primaries when he said this is the biggest fairy tale? Now, Bill Clinton's a white nationalist, too, but he wasn't lying about Obama. And we'll get to, maybe we'll talk about Kamala Harris, maybe we won't. But the point is that when you cut your politicians out of the same cloth that you're cutting your celebrities, and the things have merged, people are not voting on issues. They're not voting on politics. They're voting on people who they want to see 
It's like in Batman. He said, why is the Joker doing that? Some men just want to see the world burn. Well, we live in a society, you know, but we live in a society where people find that shit entertaining. So you know what? Yeah. Let's see what happens. Trump, don't let him out. Yeah. But guess what? He took over the apparatus. And once he took over the apparatus, all those people who were critiquing, as you say, Ricky, they immediately switched sides. McConnell, because McConnell is the de facto leader of the White Nationalist Party, and they got their policy agenda. Young, Jane, young young Paul Ryan out of Janesville, Wisconsin. You know, young Paul got his tax cuts. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Coke and them and Mercer and all them billionaires got their tax cuts because they know they understand politics. They've rented the they've rented the politicians. The Democrats being rented uh, in a very similar way because they too are a party of capital. They're not going to put up too much opposition, but they understand that their base is the one that at least stereotypically has been affiliated and associated with everything from un labor unions to the, those who are in the most need. Who are the, So they have to at least keep up the appearance, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, you know, that they are the loyal opposition. Let me widen this up. When Trump, when it's clear, they were going to let Trump walk. But these people ginned up on this social media and this whole, they showed up last week. And so now this this is like a gift, as you say, Rick, this is a gift to the white nationalists who maintain structural power because they're going to try to put all of it off on this group and on Trump and put the toothpaste back in the tube. That's Ben Sass. That's mm -hmm. Tom Land of Cotton, who looked like Josh Hawley. Should I go with the open racist or should I be quiet? He calculated, so I ain't going to say nothing. So now he, he's viable for 2024. If they don't hang him, he ain't said nothing. Right. Smiling Mike Pence the same way. If we can, and then Schumer and them, realizing that they got another white nationalist in West Virginia named Joe Manchin that could still blow up the whole project, they are going to not go until we push them to do other stuff either so no i think um i think finally one of the things we we're challenged to do now is push like hell against the democratic party very strategically because what, uh, this is other thing that comes to mind immediately i notice now that the the, the so-called radicals these are the people that are blacker than everybody or more marxist and social or socialist than anybody they want to attack Bernie Sanders. They want to attack AOC. They want to attack Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, and Ayanna Presley and Ilhan Omar for voting for in the Congress, the House of Representatives, voting for Nancy Pelosi to be speaker and saying that they didn't have to do that. Do you, can you count? The Speaker of the House gets the simple majority, not the majority of people in Congress. So if they had gone over enough to move that needle under 210, Kevin McCarthy would be the Speaker of the House. It's plain, simple math. We've got to now, but once the Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker, they owe her no allegiance. It's now time to turn the Democratic Party out and push this policy agenda. And Joe Biden, don't treat politicians as celebrities. Treat them as tools. That's what the Republicans yeah. do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The, the, treat them as tools. Don't get caught up on what Joe Biden said. I don't give a damn if he's Lindsey Graham's friend. Sign. This your job. Sign. This is what you go get your boy Joe Manchin and you sign this. I want the two stacks by the end of January. I want another bill through. I want the George Floyd bill. I want the uh, John Lewis bill. I want all that. And if Pelosi start, <laughs> you, let's hem her up too. These are our yeah. enemies. I agree with Linda Sarsour and, um, and Tamika Mallory who spent how, how long were they down there with you, Ricky? I mean, my, okay. I got, you know, I got a young kid who's a sophomore at Howard, Sean Ali Mickens, uh, Muhammad Ali's great nephew. He was on them steps many a day in Louisville. I mean, but something Linda Sarsour said, I agree, and Tamika Mallory, you want your best opponents in office, and politicians aren't your friends. So now we need to start moving very quickly to treat Joe Biden like what he is. You are enemy yeah, too. Yeah. We just prefer you to the other guy. Yeah. That's, that's political maturity. No question. And, and ultimately, would you all agree with him being less dangerous than the, than the other guy? Well, but that dude, Marty, that, that's, that's a layup, right? Who isn't, who isn't, you know, less dangerous than that dude? Right. You, 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 you know what I'm saying? I, I hear right. that argument and that, that, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, I agree with that. First rule of debate, concede to your opponent everything that you can. I'm not, I've never said to anybody, yeah, we need to elect Donald Trump again. 
I'm just saying, be clear on what Joe Biden is. And Joe Biden has told you what he is. Yes. Black people continuously talk about we need a revolution. And don't be scared of that word, you know, revolution. Look, white folks talk about revolution all the time when it benefits them, contemporarily and historically. They love to talk about the American Revolution. And guess what? It was violent as hell, right? They love to talk about the Industrial Revolution. They love to talk about all these revolutions that forwarded the white supremacist agenda. But when you talk about revolutionary racial change, immediately you cast out here like some type of madman. Hmm. But Joe Biden told you, he said, Americans don't want revolution. They want incremental change. Biden said that. So hmm. all these people, I'm with, I'm with Brother Greg, everybody who think that Joe Biden is some type of hero, come on, man, you either being willfully ignorant, you're lying through your teeth, or you're incredibly politically immature. Right. If you think Kamala Harris is coming to your rescue, you better really examine what she did to black folks in Cali, right? And so the question is not was Biden better than Trump. The question is, why did the Democrats eviscerate the more progressive candidates who were committed to more meaningful change where black people are concerned in the damn primaries. You know, answer that first. And so when it mm. comes down to it, when you're left to Biden or Trump, that that's that's not a choice for us. Of course you're gonna choose Biden, right? right. You're gonna right. you know, come on. You, I mean it's the witch or the devil, you know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna choose the witch. At least she might be attractive. <laughs> right. But yeah. and, and I think that and the reason that I pose that question is that what I've heard from a lot of young folks, a lot of a lot of um Young know, folks that were Bernie supporters and, and, and had different um, you know, political uh, I ideologies, their thing was, um, you know, I won't do anything, or we might as well stay with the status quo of who was who's in office already, and and that's that that's that. that's that's what I wanted to get to because I think that that's the danger of it right now. Yes, I, I'm with you. 100% in that Joe Biden, he's nobody's savior, right? But I think that what our young folks, and that's, you know, who we're, who we're ideally talking to here on Black Man Lab, what they need to have that understanding of is, is that level of political maturity to understand, number one, Joe Biden's not the answer, but number two, you not doing something um, or stating your case is not healthy either. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. I would. Yeah, say to to a, to a degree, but I, I I think you know for our young people and some others, I think sometimes we give them a raw deal when we back them into this ideological argumentative corner of making these choices because some of them actually have a more sophisticated analysis of the structural political issues that we're facing and they don't reduce it to these individual choices in two, four, or six year election cycles. You know, so in some respects. The argument about these individuals is a little less politically mature than the overall structural engagement. Now, I'm not one to make an argument that you give up the, the, the good or even the great in search of the perfect, right? But I do, it goes back to what Brother, Brother Greg said. What I found disturbing, man, you know, from 2008 on up, with, and Barack Obama is a perfect example of this, with our people. You know, this hagiography, man, this, this deification of these folks, not just turning them into celebrities, Brother Greg, but almost turning them into deities, where if you, <laughs> if you, if you have any question, right? Because let, let me be clear about this, okay? I love Black people. I love Black people more than I love Barack Obama. I love Black people more than I love Kamala Harris. I love Black people more than I love my woman right now. You know what I'm saying? Because she might leave me any day. Okay, I love black people, all right? And, and I'm never going to sacrifice black people, but anybody, if you ask me to sacrifice black people right. to be dedicated to an individual, I'm going to back you off. And so we display, that, that's why I talked about Obama mania, how there was this mania, this madness, that black people were so in love with this cat that they could not get beyond that love to ask serious and pressing questions about the, the needs of our people, right? And so the analysis of this has to always come back to that. And this go, it goes back to tie it up to the original uh, issue that we posed from the beginning, which this session is all about. 
The question is, as Black people, how do we most effectively combat white supremacy to carve out a space for not just ourselves, but our children to enter into this world with more decency, humanity, freedom, and justice? If we're not doing that, then something is wrong. And if we're dedicating ourselves to individual politicians or individual preachers or individual athletes or individual anybody at the expense of that, then we're off course, right? And so we have to have course corrections to understand what we're dealing with. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about political maturity. You can, I can, I, I voted for Barack Obama twice, man. You know, I'm not saying he's a bad brother. He is a serviceable, hardworking, traditional Democrat. That's what he was. Which means, which so means he's for what it is. Well, no, I agree with you, brother. I mean, which means he, he's harmful to Africa because in foreign policy, Democrats and Republicans are virtually indistinguishable. Yep. He he, uh, he tried to open, normalize relationships, to, relations to Cuba. People mistook that as being progressive, but that just means that you're going to try to destroy Cuba through the market, than through <laughs> the embargo. You want you want the cruise ships to go there, <laughs> you know. So, uh, Latin America, of course. They're they're as anti-Venezuela as the GO. I mean, you know, it's not as openly racist about it. Um, but right in terms of foreign deported policy, more immigrants than Trump, no question about it, and set the stage for the things that came after. I mean, you know, so yeah. Did anybody right. want to see Stephen Miller? You know, this little fake gearing, you know, Gebbels in, in the White House? No. However, which means you got to get nope. him out of there because you know our indigenous uh, kin. You know, folks is suffering, and 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 so yes, and the like I say, immigrants of African descent, the so-called SO countries. I mean, yeah, is that going to be different under Democrats? Well, that's really um, some ways up to us, which which speaks to something we were raising earlier. You all discussing, we were thinking about it. These are things, and you're right, uh, Ricky. When when you hard when you push people into a corner and they got to pick an ideology, that's unnecessary. I mean, this isn't at the stage, right. uh, you know, dialectical materialism. We're not talking about a materialist. I mean, we can, but for cats on the street who say, look, I don't see nothing change on the Democrats and Republicans. Our obligation is to push and say, now, let's let's talk that out. Let's tease that out. Why do you say that? And and what what's informed by that? Because, again, Trump has appointed, what, 220-some members of the federal bench between the, you know, Courts of Appeals, Supreme Court, and three Supreme Court justices and, and the district court. People yeah. now caught up, as you say, over the celebrity and, and identity, identifying with an individual. So Merrick Garland, you should have picked somebody better. Everybody slow down. Once Garland is confirmed, you you put, we force, now we, we, we pick the name. In my mind, it's Kentaji Brown Jackson. You get Kentaji Brown Jackson, a sister who was one of the federal judges who was put on the bench by Obama, who stood up to the Trump administration, who's now in the D.C. District Court. You put her in Merrick Garland's seat on the D.C. Court of Appeals, and she clerked for Stephen Breyer. This is how you play politics. Then she takes a trip over the Supreme Court one night and says, Steve, you're 83. It's time to go, baby. And you, <laughs> And now you put this black woman on the court. And Clarence Thomas coming off soon because Dan Cameron, young Dan, whose oh, Supreme Court dreams have been blown up. I'm sorry, but you know, he's been blown up. I'm saying, I'm looking at Clarence Thomas like, I don't care, you know, that your wife, Jen, you know, your wife, Jenny, helped support the white nationalists who came in the Capitol. That's fine. We won't get involved in politics. I'm looking at your hair. I'm 55. My hair is turning white. You, your hair is snow white, which means what? I suspect diabetes is somewhere in heart disease. You might be off the bench in this first term too, bro. So about that, let's get two black women on the court. <laughs> so I'm saying, but 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 this, and then and then people say, well, how's that gonna change my life? Let me be very clear. Until weed is legalized in your state, please understand that the most important person in in the life of many of our people is who who the judge. And if it's a federal issue. You probably don't want a 38-year-old white nationalist who was vetted by the Federalist Society sitting on the bench with mandatory minimums in place. You got we got to play three-dimensional. We got to think both and. We got to push uh, criminal justice reform in the federal level, but also state and local. We got to try to change some of these judges or get, at least replace them with people who will be more open. And meanwhile, we do the most important thing finally, which is the local organizing. 
These are not either or thing. You want to see your community change, understand who gives the permits. Atlanta is probably the best lab for that. Maurice and them cats, Hobson, and writing about Black Atlanta. I mean, go back to Maynard Jackson, where you see yeah. class conflict come out in open conflict because the poor people in Atlanta, look at how it congealed around the Atlanta child murders. It's like, Jack, they booed Maynard Jackson in part. Yeah, progress, when you get inside the Black community, can fracture around class division. So we got cool. lessons that we've learned. We got to apply in this moment. Doesn't like you said. Let's not get caught up in celebrity politics. Yeah, yeah. And, and we got to be open to having these conversations. Yes. Right. Got to educate ourselves as much as possible, so we're coming to the table, having mature conversations, and not getting angry with our brothers and sisters, and especially our children That's when they have a different point of view. That's but working through these things and not coming in with some type of narcissistic intellectual superiority either. You know, feeling like, oh, well, I'm right about everything. Because once you hear the other side, when I'm talking about the other side, I'm talking about different points of view on the Black world, then we can come out of that still loving one another. And maybe all of us have shifted just a little bit to strategize for next week. Because remember, we voted for the Democrats, so we only got seven days to plot. Right. <laughs> no, I'm glad. I know we're gonna keep it, but I'm glad you said that, particularly as it relates to Obama, because you're right. It's dangerous anytime you bring up Obama because we just haven't proven we're mature enough to have that conversation. But the reason yeah. we keep bringing up Obama is, for me, two very quick reasons. One is we got stuck with the bill for Obama with with no benefits. In other words, white nationalists treated Obama blacker than his policies. <laughs> <laughs> so part of the reason Trump is able to organize the uh, the uh, the the what, what they call it when he say they didn't have a birth certificate, the birther movement and all that and get out there is because they painted Black Barack Obama culturally much blacker than anything he did politically. And the other reason is that if we're not careful, we're gonna get stuck with that same bill in four years because mm -hmm. Vice President Harris hasn't proven she can win a, pre a presidential primary. In fact, I would be very surprised if Governor Stacey Abrams, if she runs in two years and beats Brian Kemp like a drum, doesn't primary her. And, yeah. so, and so, you know, we're not we're not guaranteed to get not to get a better Trump, a softer voiced Trump, a Tom Cotton or somebody like that who will come in. And if we're not careful, we're going to get stuck with the bill again. So, and you know, Mark, we're about to run out of time. We've got about five minutes left. Oh, man. But this bleeds into a this bleeds into another issue outside of politics, and that is how black the black masses approach black elites. Right. We are very, very quick at this point to accept black elites, whether they're political, business, in academia, you know, sports, whatever, and these black elites who will sell their mother in the name of vulgar personal opportun opportunism. No question. And we'll sit back and say, oh, that brother just doing what he got to do to get there. That sister just doing what she got to do to get there. And if you offer any type of critique about how these people are selling you down the river, folks will tell you that you a hater, right? And so yes. we got to get more mature on that because we don't just accept these people. We celebrate them. Because let me tell you something real, real quick. And Negroes in Louisville and in Kentucky got to own it. When Dan they talk all that trash about Daniel Cameron now, but when Daniel Cameron won that election last year, there were a whole lot of black people. Oh, it's a brother. He the first statewide elected black man in the history of Kentucky. We got to celebrate that brother. And we were, I was at an event pre-plague where black folks were running up to take pictures with him. Of course. They were like, hey, why don't you come take a picture? And I'm like, I'd be damned if you get me in that picture. Hey, Ricky, that's, a, that, that's how that brother almost won in Detroit. Remember the, the Republican they ran up there, Gary, whatever his name is, he almost knocked off the senator for that very same reason. Race. For the very same reason. <laughs> like, no. That's right. Brothers, man, let, I, I, I let it go. I let, I let y'all. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, sorry, no, no, no. Right. I let it go because. This is a rich conversation. It is one that 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 we have to have, um, and it's it's this this time slot isn't enough for the amount of um, knowledge and information that can be exchanged um, with with this topic matter. Um, as as Rick said, we are up against the clock. Um, but before we we, we close out, um, typically what we do is we ask you know, about habits, rituals, and disciplines. But I don't want to do that today. Uh, I, I want to make sure that our, uh, if there are young folks out there or if there are parents 
um, that that have young folks that that we are giving them some sort of tool. So I'm going to ask each of you guys. You give me three books that and and um, I know both of you well enough to know and and and, and Greg right behind you. You got part of your that's just a piece of your library. I know you you, you got a ton. <laughs> um, and Rick, I know you the same way. But three three books that you would say are really good kind of starting points for folks that want to have a a interest and background on on what we talked about as a topic here what got us here as it relates to white supremacy um some baseline books that that we can give some young folks uh, to walk away with um that they can use kind of as a baseline to get them moving in that direction to have a good understanding of of uh white supremacy and, and where we are today. Um, okay. okay. Well, you, 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 what you say, Rick, you want me to go? Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'll okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, man, first of all, thanks again, Marty, and everybody in, in the last scene, Molly, everyone. Um, I'll keep this very short. I'm sitting here doing the same thing you're doing, reading, you write some books down. Let me think about it. Because yeah. my orientation, and this is why many people who are in Black Studies and, and Pan-African Studies, African Studies, are not in Black Studies. Mm-hmm. They are, you know, Daoud Azibo used to make the distinction between Black Studies and the study of Blacks. It's what Anderson Thompson used to call death white studies. Black Studies is popular now because Negroes think they can get a check. But, but Black Studies, as you say, Ricky, reveals the fact that all the other disciplines are anchored in white studies. Mm. And so, yeah. you know, this this whole narrative has to shift, I think. So, so in my mind, Help, helping our people, particularly young people, understand white supremacy is important, but it shouldn't be the center of how we organize the way we think about the world. What we don't get enough of, in fact, virtually none of in this country, is a deeper understanding of who we are to ourselves. And that will help us understand how white supremacy tries to displace that. So the three books very quickly, I suppose the closest to getting a sense of how white feels operates a little book by Cedric Robinson. Mm-hmm. That is book, Black Marxism, is a book that I use a lot in my Introduction to African Studies course called Black Movements in America. Robinson is distinguishing between black people and the field of violence we find ourselves in. Not black American movements, no. Black movements in America. Don't think of America as your as the place you share with everybody that you were all together. No, hell no. Black movements in America. That's number one. That helps. The second of the three, I'm thinking about uh, a brother, continental African, Aikwe Arma, Baba Aikwe, his book, The Eloquence of the Scribe. What are the foundations of thinking work we should be doing as African people anywhere in the world? So there's that's a good one. And then the final one, let's thought about it. You can't go wrong with Du Bois. I, Souls of Black Folk, I will put it maybe at last among all his books. I say, if you ain't read Black Reconstruction, but he's got a book of 10 speeches he gave, almost all of them to HBCUs, most of them at, co- at commencements. It's called The Education of Black People. That is a brilliant book. We teach it a lot. We do it in freshman seminar often at Howard. Those three books, I think, particularly the education of black people, maybe for young people to understand what's at stake and how we can get out of this mess. Yeah. I'm gonna switch up because I was gonna go Du Bois and 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 you hit Du Bois. You so, can't do wrong with Du Bois. Go ahead, bro. Give me no. <laughs> du Bois, my favorite intellectual. James Baldwin, you know, my favorite uh, uh, writer, novelist. But I'll go with these three, man, to add to what Brother Greg said. She come to joke. Um, African origin civilization. That's a good one to hit when you talk about global structures and how Black people fit into it. Yes. Um, Rodney, how how Europe underdeveloped Africa. You know, that's, I think that that's a key one. And then I'm going to go kind of off script one, for, especially for young people, when you talk about education, how education can be so incredibly oppressive. Uh, Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Mm. You know, and, and that ain't specifically black, but it's, it's about uh, domination, hegemony, right? So Pedagogy of the Oppressed, how Europe underdeveloped Africa and the African origins of civilization. Those are the three that I would put out to people uh, to close this thing out. And, and uh, Marty, yeah. uh, I, I, I love to add just three because I, I, I love what I just heard as well. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm with you, uh, Brother Carr, with uh, Arma. I love Arma. Um, I love the heal. I love the healer. <laughs> you know, the healers speak to our uh, our collective under orientation of how 
we understand philosophically certain things. Yes, sir. And so, uh, and I, I like to go with J.A. Rogers from Superman to Man because mm. it's, a, it's a novel text that anybody could read and really learn from. You know, and and, um, and and lastly, since we were talking about politics, let's go with Haynes Walton, Black Politics. The man. Yeah. Because yeah. He, he, the he gives a, yeah, he gives a great deal of information on the history of Black politics in this country, and he yeah. and he just overwhelms us with some jewels in that book. So I appreciate y'all, brother. Appreciate no, you, no. Derek. Hey, appreciate you, Derek. Thanks for jumping in with those. Um, and uh, my favorite. That, that I would put out there too is uh, Chancellor Williams, um, the destruction of Black civilization. No question. That, yeah. that that book was the opening for me, of um my my I guess you could say African blackness when I was at Howard, um and taking my Black diaspora class. So, um, wow. I see my brother Maoli has jumped back in here. He's he back on there. He's there, Maoli. He's, 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 what up, fam? We what's just, up, uh, man? I got yeah. back to the crib. I got a break in the birthday action. <laughs> I got a break in the birthday action. Ain't mad at you, brother. <laughs> we get ready to go out to dinner and whatnot. Oh, you no, know, COVID least safe. Of yeah, course. Yeah. But Good stuff. Uh, man, I was able to watch some of it, man. Thank y'all, brothers, just dropping it. Um, you know, we got to get, we got to do a part two. Hey, we got to yeah. unpack it. Yeah, well, when you call, we answer, man. Congratulations to you. Saw you were honored as, as like one of the, what, 100 most powerful people in Atlanta or something like that. I was like, how did they name this Negro? I mean, what, what, <laughs> they, put, they put that target on his back. That's a, had to, we got to protect Miley Davis at all costs. Right? <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> hey, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So we just, we go keep grinding, keep building. Um, looking forward and, and appreciate both of you brothers' contribution to the um, to the book and this project that we're doing with the young people is going to be um, incredible, man. So um, that is exciting. yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's very much. Exciting. These young people have been on fire. Let me say, that I was, if people understand, we we lost one of our elders. We were uh, yeah, and Molly actually went representing all of us. And thank you for this, brother Conrad Worrell. Yes. And it's funny, I was reading his uh, this is a collection of his essays, World's World, for back in the day. When y'all see Molly Davis, this is this is the intellectual and cultural and political son of this brother right here. This is one of the most sophisticated political thinkers we have. And this black man laugh, like everything else you've been affiliated with, brother. I just want to say thank you because we wonder sometimes. People say, oh, where's the next generation? You've apprenticed well, brother. And all these ancestors, particularly cats like Baba Conrad. I know he's somewhere probably you probably see him in your dreams cussing in the middle of the night. You still getting <laughs> oh, <bro. laughs> But I want to thank you, brother, because what you yeah. no, no thank I want to echo that, Greg, before we go back to Maui, you know, to you, to Brother Fred. Yes. You know, to, 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 to Marty, to Jared, to everybody who's working on this. I, I think Miguel's working with y'all too. Who everybody everybody who's working on this project. What the Black Man Lab is, to mm. my thinking, it's a rescue project that is targeting our children. Yes. And in effect, everything that we do, again, is really about our children. That's because right. if we're not working to make this world, again, a better place for our children, then what the hell are we doing? And so yeah. I think that's what my brothers are doing down there, man. And, and, you know, I'm sad that I'm not in my hometown, but it is in very good hands with y'all brothers so so much love to you for the work that you're doing and man. i appreciate you for letting let me be a part of it thank thank you for that rick man we you know i think um all all those guys you just made named including myself that's it man we all know that this work is about the next generation on um, the project that that Maui's pushed forward um with with his book um we need you as we've met with these young young folks um, on the project, the, uh, the energy that they have, the intelligence that they have, um, it's, it's enlightening, it's, it is um, inspiring, and it makes us know that what we're doing right here with the Black Man Lab is the work, right? Yeah. And, and this work is not about us. It is about them wholeheartedly. That's why we do this every week. Um, Molly, unless you had anything else, man, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. 
Yeah, let's close out, y'all. Man, I, I could I could talk forever because um for me this is a reunion with brothers, you know. So um I'm not gonna do that. I just will close out. I think the hour has been well spent. We we close in the tradition of a of a queen mother, sister Njiri Algani. We we uh, lock arms. So if you all can lift up your arms and lock them and, and link up because we recognize that when we come into safe and sacred spaces like Black Man Lab and other spaces that we've been blessed to be in, we link up and we say, I am a link in this chain. I am a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. I am a link in this chain. I am a link, I am a link, in, this a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break, it here. Won't break here. We are links in this chain. We, we are links in this chain. Links in this chain. And we won't break here. And we won't break here. We won't break here. I say. I say. Brothers, I thank say. you again. Uh, Brother Greg, Brother Rick, appreciate y'all so much, man, for, for you know, being part of the lab. You all, at this point, you've been on more than, on more than one occasion. So uh, I got news for you. You're actually part of the Black Man Lab. Right? If I, if I, I want it, Bruce, I want uh, it. <laughs> and, and, and again, I say, I say this to every yeah, guest that we have. Y'all get Marty to send you that. Get Marty to send you that black man T-shirt he's been working on for six months, man. Oh, uh, here we go. Hey, here we real, go, man. So I can rock that joint. I'm gonna carry it. I'm gonna have it on, boy. You know that? <laughs> yes. Hey, hey, Miguel, Miguel, we're not gonna have this conversation, right? We're not gonna have this conversation. Look, Miguel put his hand like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody okay. watching. Mark. This is brother signifying. This is what I miss, man. About uh, playing, baby. Hey, uh, Mark. Uh, fast, man. It, I don't want to leave without saying, I said this at the front, and I'm going to say it at the back. This is my first time, you know, doing something with Brother Greg. We yeah. share a lot of people we've done. Hey, man, love you, brother, from afar. Love Much you, brother. You. you know, anytime you need somebody to ride with you, I will I will go shotgun with you, boy. You Same know, so here. Same here, brother. You know that. Look, we that time with Brother Greg. Well, we're going to build anyway, man, so it's good. Yeah, the same same here, Brother Ricky. Long time, brother. Been looking forward no. to this, this this tonight, man. Love you. Yeah, love you back, brother. Yes, sir. You see, we, Black Man Lab, bringing brothers together again. No okay. question. No question. <laughs> <laughs> man, man, look, again, I appreciate y'all, man. Thanks so much. Black Man Lab loves y'all. Uh, my brothers on the Black Man Lab, Molly, Miguel, Jared, Fred, Joe, uh, love y'all, man, and uh, we'll keep pushing, man. We'll keep pushing and get this thing right. No doubt. Stay up, y'all. Stay safe. Talk to you soon. Peace. Peace, y'all.